So welcome everybody to this MCA Price Lecture by Daniel Remenik. It's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, my colleague Daniel Remenik Sisis. Uh, he's a mathematical engineer, engineer from University of Chile. He got his PhD from Cornell University more than 10 years ago. And since 2012, he's professor at the Department of Mathematical Engineering at this, and the Center of Mathematical Modeling at the University of Chile. Uh, there, he joined the probability group, and he, he has been working in the ex exciting, defying problem of understanding the KPZ universality class for the last 10 years. So I will not speak more than that. A breakthrough in this theory is what is going to present today, the KPZ fixed point theorem. Uh, so welcome, Daniel, to, to this talk. Thank you, Alejandro, for the presentation. And I'm also grateful for the opportunity to speak here and, and present uh, this, this work or this uh, field in a way, or this part of the field. So um, yeah, what I want to do today is try to, I'm gonna talk about this thing called the KPZ fixed point, uh, but more in general, uh, what I want to do is present uh, some of the some of the, the, the questions and the main, or some of the main issues in something called the KPC universality class. So I'm gonna to try to present it uh, as softly as I can. Uh, there's not gonna be many proofs or anything. It's just gonna be uh, uh, a talk about uh, a little bit of this story. Um, okay, so the way I'm going to present uh, this KPZ universality class, uh, it's through uh, one of the classes of models in the class, which is uh, models of one dimensional random growth. So what we have here is a simulation of something called the Eden growth model. And, and this is a, it's a simple growth model. So what you have is you have these little balls in, in R2 and okay, the, the exact uh, rule doesn't exactly matter, but essentially what you do is you have a, a set of, of these uh, points which are on the boundary of the cluster. And essentially every point at, on the boundary adds a new neighbor at rate one. So it waits an exponential amount of time uh, of parameter one, and then you add a, a little ball in some of the neighboring points. So you, you choose a direction randomly and keep growing, okay? And then uh, this is, a, this is a, a cluster that starts uh, growing outwards. And what you see is the following. So, so this, is, this is already the KPZ prediction. Uh, I'm gonna get into that uh, in, in more detail later, but essentially what you see is that this interface, this red interface is growing outwards at a linear speed. Okay, so this is this T, but you're not really, okay. And it's gonna be growing outwards and you're gonna see some sort of uh, macroscopic shape, which in this case, since I'm starting from just a little dot on the middle, uh, would be something like a circle, okay? So essentially you see a circle, uh, but then what you're really interested in is to look at the fluctuations of the boundary, okay? So how, how does the boundary fluctuate around this uh, linear predicted uh, position? And what turns out is that these, uh, these fluctuations are of order t to the one third. So you, you should compare it with the usual uh, t to the half, or in this case, it would be t to a quarter, but uh, with the usual Gaussian, um, exponents. And there's a scale, a, a spatial scale, this t to the two thirds at which you should see something interesting, okay? So in truth, what you have is the following thing is that if you look at this boundary at this interface, which is what's uh, written now, uh, sorry, drawn here in, in blue, then this h of t comma x, uh, if you define it in some way, then it should look like uh, constant times t, okay? This is just the linear growth. And then, the interesting part is going to be that there's gonna be uh, fluctuations, which are of order again, t to the one third, and spatially they have to be rescaled like t to the minus two thirds. So to see this spatial structure at, at, at this order. And over there, you should see an interesting process, okay? This is the prediction. And actually what you see in this case, this all conjecture for, for this model, but in terms of the description, uh, what you see there is something called the ARE2 process, uh, and I'm gonna get uh, a little bit into that uh, later on in the talk. Um, so this is supposed to be, um, okay, here I have two, there is. This is supposed to be 
a model, it's not a particularly good model, but it's a sort of model for something like uh, the growth of a bacterial colony. Okay, so here's a, just a little uh, simulation. This is not a simulation, this is a real video of some sort of bacteria growing. It's not a, a very good biological model, but you can see that uh, essentially the way in which this grows is more or less uh, like that. It's also used, or, or this sort of thing is used for uh, models of tumor growth or things like that. Um, okay, so here is- Is it by a cellular automaton rule or? So the, 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 it's, it's what I was describing. It's, it's not exact, it's a, if you want, it's like a random cellular automaton, right? Because uh, you, you have a rule which tells you that you add a little ball on the boundary, but which one is going to be added and in which direction uh, that's going to be run. So, so it's a stochastic, okay. It's stochastic, yes, yes. And, 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 and exactly that's why one is interested in trying to understand the fluctuations, okay? Here is another model, okay, and this is another model which is very hard to, to understand. It's not exactly, uh, it's not very well understood, uh, but just as an example. So now what you have is this ballistic deposition. What you have is now, now the model is uh, taking place in Z2, and you have blocks which fall at rate one, okay, from the sky, and they just fall. And as they fall, whenever they see a neighbor, they get stuck, okay? So these are blocks which uh, stick to the sides. Here's uh, an animation, and you see this interesting uh, sort of spatial structure which is growing upwards in time uh, in this way, it's some sort of uh, Tetris, if you want, or something like that. And again, what you would expect to see here, this is a KPZ prediction, which I'm gonna... Uh, get into in a little bit more detail again. So, so what's, what's on the bottom is again, a simulation of something like this. And you should see this interface, which is growing linearly in time. And then there should be fluctuations, which are of order T to the one third with this uh, spatial structure of, at the scale of T to the two thirds. Um, but in this case, Again, you should see an interesting process. It's not going to be the same process. The prediction here is that what you should see is something called the ARI-1 process. Uh, ARI-1 process, the other one was the ARI-2 process. And here, when they, when, they fall, when they fall, they fall uniformly at random horizontally yes. or? Exactly. In, in every site, you have a, a block which is going to fall at rate one. So uh, technically, if you want, you have a Poisson process on top of each site and they start falling, but they don't go all the way down, they get stuck, okay? If they went all the way down without getting stuck, it would be a different model, uh, not as interesting. Okay, so the difference here between the previous case, which was this one, and where you see this thing called the AV2 process, and the other one, this AV1 process, is the initial condition. In the first case, I'm starting from uh, just one point and growing in all directions. Uh, this is a different geometry, uh, this, this simulation is done sort of starting growth on the whole line, and then everything is growing upwards. Okay, so good. I should go back to my, sorry about that. Okay, so that's just so that I was able to, oh, no, I should not have done that. Uh, so sorry for that. So, so this is just, uh, another video, and this is showing, I mean, th this is sort of this ballistic deposition uh, really taking place in nature. Uh, so th this is, in a way, maybe this is indeed a, a good model. So what you have here, this is a windshield and it's frozen because it's very cold and it's raining. So you have these, uh, these droplets which are going down on this uh, glass and they go down, 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 down until they sort of meet a little piece of uh, ice and they get frozen and, and you have this interface uh, growing in this way. So it, it, it really looks very much like what I was showing you before. Okay, good. So um, those two were just take them as motivation because we really can't say very much about any of those two models they are too complicated. Uh, now, how did this story get started? Well, it got started in 1986 by uh, these three physicists, uh, Carter, Parisi, and Zhang. And what they did is they uh, introduced an, a stochastic partial differential equation, uh, the one over here, uh, which is they, they proposed as a canonical uh, equation for random interface growth. And the, the important thing they did is that they sort of 
identified the three main mechanisms that should be uh, that you should have in one of these models to see something interesting of, of, the, of the sort of what I was showing you before. So uh, this piece here, that's a space time where, so, so this is an equation for the evolution of this uh, height, okay? So the, the dt, the derivative in time of this h, uh, on the right-hand side, I'm gonna have a random part, which is the space-time white noise. This is just, uh, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a completely decorrelated noise in every point of space and time. And it's essentially what's giving you the random part. Uh, then there's the smoothing mechanism. So th that's just the Laplacian, it's the second derivative. So it's, it's what's keeping the, 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 the shape of this interface uh, smoother. Okay, so this is very, the, the space-time white noise is very rough, uh, but of course this Laplacian term is gonna try to keep it a little bit, um, a little bit smoother. And the very important part, part is this lateral growth uh, term. So what you have here, this is dx of h is just the slope of the height, okay? Uh, the, 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 it's squared because um, essentially you, you, do a, you do a first order approximation, that's what they did, and they proposed this model with, with this square. Uh, but essentially the idea is that this uh, interface is not growing only upwards, it's really growing outwards, okay? So like in this, uh, picture over here. Uh, in, in all the models, uh, that I in the two models that I showed you, the, the interface wants to grow outwards in the direction sort of uh, proportional to the, uh, to the slope, okay? Somehow sort of filling holes as it goes, okay? So those are the three mechanisms. And this is a very complicated SPD. It, in principle, it's, it's hard to, well, not in principle, it's, it's hard to make sense of it. Uh, so Martin Heyer, uh, actually made sense of this uh, in, in 2013, um, but we, we, we won't really need to get into that. I should say that this lateral growth me mechanism is really sort of playing a key role. If you remove that, then you get something completely different, okay? If you remove that, you're gonna get an interface that's sort of trying to grow up and the fluctuations change completely. They are of order T to the one quarter and they become Gaussian. Okay, so not these interesting processes that I, I was telling you about. If you look at the interface, what you would see is something like a Brownian motion in that case. Okay, uh, so it's really this lateral growth mechanism which is bringing something new into this game. Okay, so it's a good time now to introduce uh, what's known as the uh, KPZ one, two, three scaling. So I have been telling already a couple of times that as my interface growth grows, what I expect to see, and this was the physical prediction by Carter, Parisi, and Zhang, which they did essentially by these sort of renormalization techniques uh, from physics, uh, is that your interface should be growing. Okay, you're gonna have this linear growth, but the important part is that after you subtract that linear growth, uh, one more time, the fluctuations should be of size t to the third, and the spatial scale at which you're gonna see an interesting process, uh, or at which you're gonna see uh, interesting correlations is order t to the two thirds. Okay, so, sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, so I want to introduce a scaling. I want to take my height function, uh, this one here, and I want to rescale it in a way which is going to reflect uh, those uh, exponents. Okay, so, well, one, one way would be simply to use this temporal parameter t and rescaling this way, but it turns out to be more interesting to keep, uh, keep the dependence on t in the model. So what I'm going to do is instead of sending t to infinity, now what, what, what we do is we introduce a parameter epsilon, which is gonna go to zero. And what I do is I put a minus three halves, an epsilon to the minus three halves next to t, okay? And now epsilon is going to zero with t fixed. And if, if this is giving me the temporal, uh, the, the, the temporal scale, it means that this t to the one third now should be an epsilon to the minus a half, okay? And this t to the two thirds should become an epsilon to the minus one. And that's what's done in this KPZ scaling that I, that I uh, introduced, okay? So I take my height function h and I introduce this parameter epsilon, I rescale, uh, fluctuations like epsilon to the half 
space like epsilon to the minus one and time with this epsilon to the minus three halves. That's uh, where this name one, two, three scaling comes from uh, after having subtract, and, and then I subtract this linear growth. And I am interested in the behavior of this H. Okay. Good. Um, so this is the sort of the sort of uh, object, this rescaled height function that I want to look at uh, for, in general, any model in this class. Okay. Uh, so one thing that I should say is that this KPZ equation plays an important role in the theory, uh, but it's just one more model in the class, okay? So I showed you already the Eden growth model. I showed you this ballistic deposition model. Here's another model, which is the one that was introduced uh, by Carter, Parisi, and Zhang, the one that gives the name to the class. Uh, but in, in the talk, it won't really play any uh, special role, okay? So here's what one might call the KPZ universality conjecture. So this conjecture says the following. It says that uh, for any model in this KPZ universality class, if you look at the height function, okay? Uh, so part of what I'm saying here is that every model in the class has something uh, which is analogous to a height function. So you take a model in the class, you define whatever corresponds to the height function. And then if you do this one, two, three rescaling, this is the same scaling that I was showing uh, in the previous slide. Then uh, as epsilon goes to zero, I should converge to a limiting process. The point being that this limiting process should be universal. It should not depend on the model. It should be the same process um, for every model in the class. Okay, so it's it's in a way it's what's sitting in the middle of the class, uh, and everything should go to to this uh, to this limiting model. Uh, okay, the, as I was saying, the the this, this the distribution of this process is universal. It should it, it doesn't depend on the model because it's this universal limiting point. It does depend on the initial data. As I was showing you before, if I started this Eden growth model from one point and I grow outwards, I see this thing called the AV2 process. Uh, when I start from a flat interface, I see this AV1 process, okay? So it does depend on the initial data, data but nothing else, okay? And of course, there's, there's gonna be some uh, little constants here that I have to put in. Those are not universal either. So you may, you may change the constants. Uh, depending on the model, uh, but then the limit should be always the same. Um, so I have been focusing on uh, interface uh, stochastic interface growth, but this is not the only sort of uh, process that should be in the class. So there's stochastic reacting diffusion equations, uh, directed polymers, or, uh, a special model called maybe directed polymers. It may not be what you have in mind if you think of a polymer, uh, something called as passage speculation, some sort of uh, some classes of interacting particle systems. So this is a very big class, uh, which one of the most prominent examples is uh, stochastic interface growth. And I should say that um, we have very limited understanding of the class, except in some very special cases. So for things like ballistic deposition or the even growth model, uh, there isn't much we can say, okay? Except, I mean, we have all these conjectures that I was telling you about, uh, but the, the precise understanding and analytical results are, are really out of reach because the models are too complicated. But anyway, so what th this is this KPZ universality conjecture. You, you can also think of it as the definition of the class. Okay, there's something a little bit circular here because I'm saying that every model in the class should converge to this height function, uh, but I don't know what the more, which are, what's a definition of the model in the class. This, you can also think of it as a definition, right? Something is going to be in the KPZ universality class if, when rescaled in this with this one, two, three rescaling, it converges to um, this object on the right, uh, which should be universal. So, so this is what, in a way, uh, you, you can take as identifying uh, the the class. Okay. So, as I was saying, we, we have very limited understanding, except in some very special cases. Um, so, the the understanding and the way of constructing this object on the right. Uh, came from uh, analyzing a specific model, which is simpler and for which we can say things. Okay, and this model is a very well-known model in, in, in probability and in statistical physics uh, called the totally symmetric exclusion process. 
I'm going to introduce that next. It's a, it's a simple uh, interacting particle system. So look first at these blue dots, these blue particles. So this is a system of particles which are evolving in the integer lattice. Okay, so we have particles in Z. And what they do is every particle tries to move to the right at rate one independently. Okay, in principle, independently. So every particle jumps to the right at rate one. Rate one, every particle is just performing a Poisson process of rate one. And they try to walk to the right, but there's this exclusion rule uh, like here, which tells you that you can only have one particle per site. So when you have a particle tries trying to jump on top of an already occupied site, you forbid that. Uh, that's, that's the system. Okay, this is a totally symmetric version uh, where particles only move to the right. You can have uh, slightly more complicated or really more complicated uh, versions where particles can move to the right or to the left. Uh, but this is a version I want to focus on. And to this particle system, you can associate a height function. Okay, and the height function is what's drawn in red on top. And it's really very simple. So the mapping is simply in this case that uh, above every particle, I am drawing a little piece of of a line with slope one. And above every hole, I am uh, associating a piece of a line of slope minus one. And then this defines uh, an interface. And this interface is evolving in time according to the dynamics of these particles, right? And really, if you map these dynamics of particles moving to the right uh, at the level of the interface, what you see is that every time you have a local maximum, this local maximum becomes a local minimum at rate one. That's all that's going on. Here. So you start with this sort of sawtooth-like uh, path, and every local maximum becomes a local minimum uh, at rate one. This is what uh, the process does. Okay, so I'm gonna say this very briefly, but you can think of this in a way as a, as a discretization of the KPZ equation, essentially. Uh, what you have is that every site uh, is jumping down by two uh, at rate one. Uh, if you are at a site where you see this local maximum, but this indicator function of a local, a local maximum can be written in this way. So again, I'm not going to go into the details. You can just write it like that, where these are discrete difference operators, and this is the this is a discretization of the Laplacian. Uh, so basically, you have the smoothing mechanism here. That's a discrete version of the Laplacian. And this is a, a discrete version of this lateral growth mechanism. Okay, So somehow the same ideas appearing, the, the same um, components in the KPZ equation appear here. Okay. It, it's not really a discretization of the KPZ equation. This model does not converge to a KPZ equation. Um, but if you added asymmetry, so if you allow particles to go to the right or to the left, you could make, I mean, it's not that you could, one can make it converge to a KPZ equation. Uh, but the basic point here is that these, uh, these um, mechanisms of smoothing of, well, the random part and the lateral growth mechanism are embedded in the model. Okay, so this is a model that has been studied for a long, long time, both in probability and in physics, and a lot is known. And the basic cases, so what I'm calling here is TASEP with special initial data, was actually solved uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Okay, so here's here's what what happens. So the the easiest case is something called the corner or narrow wedge initial condition, uh, which in terms of particles, it's the the configuration drawn on the top. It's just you put particles on the left and no particles on the right, and the height function simply looks like this. This is the initial data. It's just a wedge. And then you make it grow, go down, okay? And after a long time, you're gonna see something, this is a real simulation. Uh, so you're gonna see something like, uh, like this uh, red curve. And what was shown, uh, this is, this. okay, I, I have some citations here. It's, it's basically due to Johansson and to Prahofen and Spahn at the beginning of, of, uh, of the century, I guess. Uh, it essentially it also goes back a little bit earlier to in, in a slightly different guise uh, to Bike, Dyke, and Johansson. Uh, but what you see is that as t goes to infinity with this rescaling, okay, again, this is the scaling in time, you get convergence to what I was telling you is called uh, the ERE2 process. Okay, so the ERE2 process would be this 
this red curve after you subtract the parabola. Okay, so the parabola is like the macroscopic shape uh, that you get from the curvature of the initial condition. And on top of that, you get these fluctuations, which are uh, area two. And the nice thing is that this process is a stationary process. Okay, so after you remove the parallel, you see something that's it looks the same everywhere. And the marginals, so the distribution of each point, well, it's the same because the process it's stationary, so it's the same everywhere. And they're given by something called the Tracy Whedon GV distribution, which I'm going to introduce in a moment. The flat case, which is the one on the bottom, um, corresponds at the level of particles to having, it's called the per periodic initial condition. So you put a particle, a hole, a particle, a hole, particle, a hole, like that. And then the initial data from far away, well, it looks like this sawtooth, okay? And from far away, it looks uh, really flat. So that's why this is called the flat initial condition. And what you see after some time will be something like this red curve. And, okay, you do the same scaling, and you get convergence to what I was calling the AV1 process. Now, now there's no parabola, there's nothing because of the initial condition is flat. So what I see in the limit uh, should be flat. Uh, so this is from uh, the middle of the previous decade, so or maybe two de decades ago now, uh, but sort of 15 years ago, uh, this was proved. And again, this Harry one process is stationary. And if you look at the marginals, they're given now by something called the Tracy Whedon GOE distribution. And these two distributions are where random matrices show up. So that's what I want to uh, introduce briefly next. So, okay, let me maybe stop again for a moment. So what I'm doing is I am looking at the distribution at one point here, okay? The distribution away from this parabola. I'm gonna tell you who's this Tracy Whedon GUE distribution. So GUE, here comes, uh, it's just an acronym for something called the Gaussian Unitary Ensemble. So the Gaussian Unitary Ensemble is one of the most basic models in random matrices. So what's a GUE matrix? A GUE, ma GUE matrix is simply the following thing. You take an N times N uh, random emission matrix where every entry is Gaussian. Okay, so you just uh, fill in your matrix with uh, complex Gaussians. Uh, that just means that you have a real part and an imaginary part and they're both Gaussian and independent. And you put it in and then you just condition it on being uh, emission. Uh, and what you want to look at is the spectrum of this random matrix. So what I, what I put here is a simulation of uh, the histogram of, a, of, the, of, of the eigenvalues for a large uh, matrix. And uh, what Wigner did already from 40, 50 years ago, he proved that this histogram converges to a semicircle. Okay, so this is what you see. Uh, but basically the, the eigenvalues concentrate in this interval between minus two root n and two root n. Now, th this is not necessary really for what I'm going to talk about, but just some history. Uh, why were random matrices uh, introduced? So they were introduced by, by uh, Eugene Wigner again in the 60s. So what he was trying to do is he was trying to propose a model for the, say the spectral lines of a heavy atom. Okay, so if you have a heavy atom, um, a, 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 an explicit or an analytic uh, solution is very hard if you want to sort of analyze the, the quantum mechanics behind it uh, and, and try to see where, where these lines uh, fall. Uh, but what he proposed is that they should behave statistically like the eigenvalues of uh, a random matrix like this, okay? And actually experimentally, they can check that yeah, this is the case. So I'm, I'm not being very precise, uh, but basically you should think of these spectral lines of lying uh, in, in, in a distribution, which is statistically very similar to the distribution of uh, the eigenvalues of a GUE random matrix. Um, so something that, many of you might have seen or, or heard about is that it's very surprisingly this distribution of eigenvalues uh, shows up in many other places and maybe this is the most surprising one so if you look at the uh, Riemann zeta function and you just graph the zeros on the critical line okay this is what's done here so these blue dots are the zeros of the Riemann zeta function on the critical line up to I think the, I think the plot goes up to 100 um, then what you see uh, is something which, if you look far away, and, and you, I mean, if you look at, at, at 
uh, the first n zeros with n very large. And you look at the distribution of the gaps between these uh, zeros, they behave very much like the gaps between uh, the design values. So, so this is a this is a, a, an area in, in mathematics and in physics which has exploded in interest. Uh, there's many connections with uh, many interesting connections with many people and, and, and uh, diverse topics. Um, but but as I was saying, it it, it was introduced uh, in the context of uh, spectral lines of, of heavy atoms. Okay, so really what, what I want to focus on is not really on, on, on this Wigner's semicircle law, but really uh, what shows up in these KPZ models is the distribution of the largest eigenvalues. Okay, so this lambda GUEN is, I'm, I'm giving you the name, it's just the largest eigenvalue uh, among the N uh, eigenvalues. Okay, so this one should be centered at least under the scaling around. Uh, to root n, because that's where the eigenvalues uh, lie. And what was discovered is that um, if you recenter around these two root n, then fluctuations are of order n to the minus a sixth. Okay. And if you multiply by n to the sixth and take a limit, uh, you get convergence to, uh, to a distribution. Okay. So you see something non trivial as you converge, as, as you take a limit in this way. And this one sixth here is, well, it's curious, um, but look, check that there's a one sixth here and there's a one half there. So the relation between one half and one sixth is of course uh, one third. And well, I wouldn't say that it is the same one third that I was showing you, but in a way it's the same scaling that, uh, that I was showing you for the KPZ models, okay? Uh, okay, that, this is GUE. So this is the Tracy Whedon GUE distribution. Okay, this, the, the asymptotic distribution of the largest eigenvalue of a random Gaussian emission matrix. And then there's something called the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. Uh, and that's a very similar story. It's slightly more complicated, but it's essentially the same story where your matrix is not now real, symmetric, and Gaussian. Okay, so you change uh, this emission matrix by a real symmetric matrix, do the same analysis, and you get convergence under the same scaling to something, to, to a new random variable uh, that I'm calling, uh, that's called the, the Tracy Whedon GOE distribution. And somehow, uh, magically, if you want, or very surprisingly at least, these are the distributions that appear for these two initial conditions. Okay, so somehow you get these random matrix uh, objects uh, show up here. Something that I should say is that um, these two results use some very, very special properties of these two initial conditions, okay? And, and there's, there's some very special algebraic and combinatorial identities, uh, which are the ones that allow people to get these results and get these uh, random matrix uh, distributions. And, and, and that's how they show up. Okay, so I want to make a little break um, for questions, but this looks like a good time to show you one last video. So this is nothing to do with TensorFlow. It's just another video of uh, KPZ front in nature. So this is really, this is popular fluff in a park in, in Spain and it burns very fast. So you have this, uh, this burning front that's an advancing. And as it, as it advances, it, it really looks like one of these KPZ fronts that I was showing. So, so this would be really a, a sort of, uh, well, not a model, but, but a, a phenomenon for which uh, the type of phenomenon that uh, Carter, Paisi, and Jan were thinking about. Okay, but this was just an excuse to show you this video, which I find uh, nice. But uh, now I stop in case there are any questions. I have a question. Uh, what you mentioned about the relation with the, the zeros of the Riemann zeta function, yes. uh, is that just conjectural or is there any proof about that? Good question. I should yeah. have said something. So this is, uh, this is the relation. I, I didn't even say exactly what the relation is. It's, it's just, again, an excuse to mention something that I think is very interesting, but it, it's not really part of what I'm going to talk about. Um, but yeah, the relation is, it has not been proved there's no good proof, there's no good understanding, there's some understanding and there's some sort of intermediate scales. 
Um, but if you do it numerically, it fits perfectly. It's amazing. Uh, and the, 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 the way in which it, it fits is pretty precise. Okay, so you can look at something called the correlation kernel between these points. Like you think of it as a, as a point process. So you can think of these zero, the, the zeros are deterministic, but you can think of them as being a, coming from some random process. And then you look at the correlation kernel and it fits amazingly uh, precisely the ones for the eigenvalues of a random matrix. Okay, and I, and I guess there's, there's no idea on how to prove that or there is uh, any, any clue or nothing. As far as I know, there is no good idea, but I, I am not really very close to number theory to know better, but, but no, I, I would say that essentially there's no good out here. Thank you. Daniel, I think we can continue in the sense okay. that a little bit running out of time, so yep. just reschedule. Okay, so um, here's the theorem which we proved. So I was saying, as I was saying, this, this, um, these limits were proved for special initial conditions and it remained open for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years to try to construct the limit in general. So, so this is what we managed to do with Jeremy Costell and Konstantin Matetsky uh, three or four years ago. And the theorem is the following. It says, so it's a theorem for TASEP, though it has been extended already to other models. Uh, but the, the, the theorem is the following. If you look at the height function of TASEP, okay, so this height function that I was showing you uh, where local maxima become local minima at rate one, then if the initial profile converges, okay, so you take the initial height function, you rescale it. This is just diffusive rescaling. Uh, for those of you who, who understand what I'm saying, it's just the, the, the same scaling that takes a random walk to a random motion uh, because there's no T part. So this is just initial condition. If you, if you assume that the initial condition converges to some limiting profile and okay, the, 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 the class of initial data has to be uh, functions which are upper semi-continuous with some growth condition. But if you have a, a appropriate convergence to this limiting profile, then, this one, two, three rescaled height function, exactly the one that I was uh, introducing before, it goes to something. And this thing, so the limit exists, uh, it's this left-hand side, it's what was showing up, it won't, or, or we propose it as the, the thing that shows up in the KPC universality conjecture is what should be the universal limit of every model in the class. And what it is, it is a Markov process, Okay, it's a Markov process taking values in this space of upper semi-continuous functions. So you should think of it like in this little picture here, uh, you have some initial profile, which could be smooth, maybe not. It's just upper semi-continuous, the, the, the curve in gray, and then you evolve it in time. And this evolution, well, it then gives you uh, this uh, interface after some time, the, which in this case is this green one. Uh, and this evolution is Markovian at the level of the evolution of this interface. Okay, so this H is, what's called uh, the KPZ fixed point. Uh, the, the name fixed point is from the fact that it's invariant, it's fixed under this one, two, three rescaling. So if I take this object and I, re I, I introduce some alpha, some positive parameter, and I rescale it in this way, okay, the, one, the, the same scaling essentially that I'm doing here, okay, so that's the one, two, three rescaling, it's the same rescaling uh, over there. Okay, I also have to rescale the initial data so that uh, I keep everything uh, at the same level. But under this rescaling, I get back the same model. Okay, so this is just like uh, Brownian motion being uh, self-invariant, if you want, under, under diffusive rescaling. This it's the same sort of uh, the, the same sort of statement that I make. Okay, so so this KPZ fixed point is fixed under the scaling. And a very rough way of thinking it is that, okay, it should be the, the limit of every model in the class. So somehow you should think of it, and this is, this is not meant to be rigorous in any sense, but you should think of it as being a, an attracting fixed point for all models in the class. So you take a model, you rescale it uh, in this one, two, three way, and, and, and you take epsilon to zero, and it is this KPZ fixed point which should be attracting every model in the class, okay? Uh, so just to say some things about uh, how it looks, well, it, if, if you fix 
see and look at this process in X, then it is holder one half minus. Okay, so it's it's uh, it's a bit rough, and actually it looks locally like a Brownian motion. Okay, and this can be made precise in, in several ways. Okay, so it really locally looks like a Brownian motion, and now if you fix space and look at the evolution in time, then this evolution is holder one third. Okay, and and the relation between this one half and this one third is just this one, two, three scaling. It's just the two and the three uh, playing together. Okay, so this is what it is. It's a Markov process at the level of this interface evolving uh, in time. And uh, what's written up here, because I'm gonna get, get to this in a moment, is that, uh, okay, it's a Markov process and the way in which it is uh, described is through its transition probabilities. Okay, so there's a formula telling you that if you start this process with your initial profile, this H0, uh, and you ask what is the probability that at time t, uh, the height is going to be less than a given R1, R2, R3, at points X1, X1, X2, X3, and so on. Well, this is given by an explicit formula, okay? Uh, and this explicit formula is given in terms of a freedom determinant of a certain kernel, which I'm going to introduce. In a moment. So a Fredholm determinant, if you have not seen it before, it's just uh, uh, the natural uh, infinite dimensional extension of, uh, of the usual determinant. Uh, so there's a determinant and there's a kernel here. There's just an operator uh, mapping L2 to L2 uh, of which you compute the determinant and this gives you this transition probability. Okay. And once you have these transition probabilities, you can show that this characterizes the distribution of the process and you can show that it's Markovian and so on. So I, I want to focus now on telling you who's this guy appearing here. So I'm gonna only do it at the level of one point distributions just for simplicity, okay? So I'm not looking at several different points, I'm just looking at one point. What's the probability that the height at time t and space x is less than r? And what do you see? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go briefly over this because it's a little, a little bit dizzying, but there's some, some things I want to point out. So this is, this is the, the, the operator and the operator in the end is not so complicated, okay? So it, it, it factors into three pieces. So there's a, a sort of conjugation by something I'm calling ST minus X and STX, which is this guy over there. Okay, so the, this D on the top is just the derivative operator. Okay, so there's a certain differential operator. It's, it's really explicit, it's convolution by something involving an area function. Uh, but there's this, this, um, this differential operator or the semi-group if you want, uh, acting on the two sides. And in the middle, there's something we call the Brownian scattering operator. And what the Brownian scattering operator does, so instead of uh, reading all that, I'm just gonna focus on the picture. What you do is the following, you fix an L, okay? So you go from minus L to L and you run a Brownian motion from time minus L to time L. And essentially what you do is you ask, what's the probability that this Brownian motion is going to hit the region or the hypograph, the region below H0, okay? The hypograph of H0. H0 is the initial condition, okay? so. I want to compute something about the KPZ fixed point with initial condition H0. And what I do is I run a Brownian motion and I try to hit the hypograph. And I ask, what's the probability that I hit this hypograph, okay? So this defines for me a certain, uh, a certain kernel, which is the one that's, that's telling you the, essentially the transition probability for a Brownian motion hitting this hypograph. And then what you do is something which looks uh, a bit strange, but it can be done. Essentially what you do is now you take L to infinity. Okay, so you have to compensate it in a way. This is done here in this formula, but that's what you do. So essentially you are, what you're looking at is a Brownian motion coming from minus infinity, exiting at plus infinity. And along the way, you ask what's the probability that it's going to hit the initial data or really the hypograph of the initial data. Um, okay, you have to make sense of that, of course. It doesn't make sense to run the Brownian motion for all time, but as I was saying, it can be done. Uh, so that gives you a kernel, okay? The one that does what I just described. You put in that kernel uh, in here, okay? This is, this is the part that depends on the initial data. The rest does not depend on the initial data. Uh, and this part 
over there um, is okay. I'm being, I'm not being rigorous. I'm trying to explain. Essentially, that does not depend on t, does not depend on x, and the dependence on t and x factorizes outside. Okay, so the dependence on the initial condition is through this thing called the Brannan scattering operator, and then there's this dependence on t and x on, on the two sides. I'm, I'm mentioning this because it's going to play a role uh, later on. And this is the, you do that, that's the kernel that you have to put inside this Fredholm determinant to compute these one point distributions. Uh, so, so, so for people who, who have followed at least uh, the way I was trying to introduce this operator, so a corollary of all this, it's essentially an obvious corollary, is that this Brownian scattering operator, the thing you get out of computing the probability of a Brownian motion coming from minus infinity to plus infinity uh, in this way, it's invertible. So if you give me that, I can tell you who was the function you were trying to hit. Okay, so I get this continuous bijection from upper semi-continuous functions to this uh, to, to this kernel uh, about hitting a Brownian motion. Okay, and I won't get into the details here. So this looks extremely complicated, but uh, one thing you can do more or less immediately, uh, at least in, in, in the area two case, uh, and in the area one case is not so hard. You can get these old processes that were uh, obtained by uh, slightly different methods, uh, not really slightly different methods, but, but using the, the special uh, special properties of, the, of those initial data that I was telling you about, uh, they can be used here as well. So essentially you have to compute these heating probabilities, but if you choose simple H zeros, then these heating probabilities for a Brownian motion are gonna be simple. And if you compute them, put them in the formulas, take limits, and so on, in a couple of lines, you get these old uh, processes. OK, so now uh, what I have done up to here is try to describe to you what, what's the KPZ fixed point. And some things you can do. So you have this explicit uh, formula, and, and you can recover the old result. But here's something uh, new and pretty surprising, I would say, uh, that uh, happens when you have these uh, formulas at hand. So I, uh, the title of the slide is integrability of the KPZ fixed point. And I, I hope it's going to be clear what I mean by that. So what I'm going to do now is introduce a function, which is essentially the distribution of the KPZ fixed point. So it, it has three variables. Uh, there's, okay, first of all, the, the initial condition here is fixed. So I just fix, uh, deterministic initial condition. And then I define this function f, which depends on time. There's a variable x, which is the place where you're looking at the, uh, this interface. And then the variable showing up in the distribution, okay, r. So I'm looking at the probability that the, this interface at time t at that point x is less than r. If you want, you can think of it as a function being defined in terms of take set. Okay, so it's just the limiting distribution of the risk one, two, three rescale take set uh, high function. So I define this thing, and here's something that shows up. Um, so this is the simplest version of the of the result. So simplest because I am choosing the simplest possible initial condition in this context, which is you start with the flat initial condition. This is the one for which I was showing you simulations in the case of ballistic initial, of, of the ballistic deposition model. So you take that. Now, since the initial data is flat, uh, you expect and, and you get the height function to be stationary. So its distribution won't depend on the point where you look at. Okay, so you run it in time, but it doesn't matter where you look. It has the same distribution simply because the evolution is stationary or it's translation invariant and the initial data is translation invariant. So it means that over here, I only have dependence on T and R and not on X. So I do that. And then I define this second logarithmic derivative of uh, the distribution of the KPZ fixed point. And what pops out is that this uh, function satisfies the KDV equation, okay? And if you find it surprising, you should. Like, we don't really have a good explanation. But this is what shows up from the formula. This is, this is the simplest case. And this is actually an instance of a more general uh, theorem. So this is uh, from a couple of years after we, we got the, the KPZ fixed point 
formulas uh, with UN equals 10. So now I define the, again this second logarithmic derivative of the of the distribution function. Now it does depend on x, okay, because the initial condition now I'm not saying much. Uh, so it, in principle, it depends on x, of course. And uh, this second logarithmic derivative, now what it satisfies is something called the kadomsev petrov lili equation, the KP equation. This is a famous, uh, completely integrable dispersive PD. And, and this is what this, um, what this distribution function satisfies, okay? KP, so, so uh, many of you will know that KDV, the way it, it classically appears is from, it's an equation for long waves in shallow water. Uh, and what KP is, is some sort of natural two-dimensional extension of that, okay? Where you have an additional parameter, which in this case is, is this extra X. Uh, but, but you can see that the KDV, yeah, the KDV equation is, is showing up inside as one piece of the, KP equation. Uh, we have, so, so th this is this the, the physical model for which uh, this was derived is what I was saying, uh, long waves in shallow water, but we have no connection. I'm gonna say a couple more things about that, but um, let me mention also that there's uh, an equation in the multipoint case, okay? So in the multipoint case, now instead of defining f of t, x, and r, now I have a bunch of x's and a bunch of r's, t is still fixed. And I introduce these two variables, x being the sum of the spatial positions and r being the sum of the ri's. And what we get, it's not really uh, worth going into the details, but essentially there's, there's a version of the KP equation called the matrix KP equation, which is uh, written uh, on here in blue, okay? It's the same equation, except that now Q is a matrix and there's an additional term uh, which vanishes in the, in the scalar case because of commutativity, but here there's no commutativity, so you do get it. So this is something called the, K, the matrix KP equation. And the point is that there is a matrix somewhere, okay? Uh, such that this matrix Q satisfies uh, this matrix KP equation. And when you compute the trace of this matrix, uh, you get the logarithmic derivative of f. Okay, we, we really have no idea. If, if you have seen things like this uh, er, before, you, you should be surprised that the endpoint distribution satisfy a closed equation. Uh, it's pretty surprising. So in, in a context like this, you would not expect the endpoint distributions to satisfy closed equations. So what may happen, and this is more usual is that maybe the end point distribution satisfy uh, an equation in terms of the n minus one point distributions and so on. So there, there, there will be a hierarchy of equations uh, from one point, two point, three point, and so on up to, and, and then you get to n point. Uh, but this is an equation for the end point distributions themselves, but not quite because uh, th th there's sort of a bigger object uh, up there, uh, which is the one that solved the equation. And then you go to the trace and you get what you want, uh, but still. so. Why is this all true? This is a good question. As I was saying, if, 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 if you see this and you're surprised, um, you, you should be surprised. At least we are still surprised. So we, we really don't have a good explanation. So, so here, there's a relation between two sort of basic objects coming from different sides of physics. And it's probably a coincidence, but we really don't have an explanation. So, the way this comes about is the following. I, I won't go into the details, but here is the main point. So it's essentially by algebra or by calculus. We have formula, so we start differentiating. And after a couple of pages, uh, you can prove what I showed you. Um, but the, the, the main ingredient is the following. So the ingredient is, well, you have determinants. Uh, you know how to differentiate determinants. You get traces so that linearizes things a bit and you can start playing uh, with these objects. Uh, but the, the key key fact is the following, is what I'm trying to highlight here, is what I was telling you about this property of the KPZ fixed point kernel, which factorizes the dependence on the initial data and separately the dependence on T and X. So this T, this S, T and X are explicit operators, okay? Which were the semi-groups associated to, to this D squared and DQ. So out of that, what you get, is that the kernel 
uh, which appears inside the freedom determinant, if you compute the derivative in time, which is something you will have to do if you start trying to prove something like what I showed you, uh, the, the, even though the kernel is very complicated and the dependence on the initial data is complicated through this Brownian scattering operator, uh, the derivative in time is very simple. You just get minus one third the derivatives in u and v, where u and v are the, the variables of the kernel. And if you differentiate in space, uh, just essentially directly, you get that now you get the difference of the second derivatives uh, with respect to, uh, again, to the variables of the kernel. So I'm, I'm almost done, but what I wanted to mention is that what this does is that in, in a way this linearizes the evolution, right? So in this sense, this is a sort of integral system. So you have a complicated evolution for this uh, random interface that's growing. Um, but if you look at it at the level of the kernels, which are governing the evolution of this uh, distribution, this evolution is linear, okay? You just differentiate in time and you get this linear PD. You differentiate in space and again, you get this linear PD, okay? So there's some sort of linear structure that's governing the evolution of all this. And then you sort of plug it in the freedom determinant and what you get is a distribution for uh, the KPZ fixed point. So just to finish, uh, I, I, I want to mention that you can get something else out of this. And it is the following. It is that, again, for these two special initial conditions, step and flat, the, the two that I was describing before, the two for which uh, random matrix distributions uh, appear, uh, you can actually use these equations and redrive these uh, random matrix distributions. So essentially, again, you use special properties of these initial conditions. In this case, the fact that they're stationary in space and they're self-similar. And as you do that, this ODE, so the computation is here and it's really not more than that, but this PDE, the KDV equation or the KP equation, depending on, on which initial condition you're taking, uh, they reduce to an ODE. And the ODE is a famous uh, ODE, the finally the two equation. Okay, and Tracy and Widom, what they had done when they derived their, their distributions was exactly to show that, uh, for example, what's written over there, that the Tracy Widom GUE distribution can be written in terms of a special solution of the Palivet 2 equation, something called the Hastings MacLeod solution. So by taking these, uh, these dispersive PDEs and doing introducing the right scaling in the particular cases where uh, you, you, you expect to see something interesting, uh, out pops uh, this pi level two equation and it connects uh, these, these uh, PDEs and, and, and through these PDEs, uh, the KPC fixed point to the old uh, random matrix distributions. Okay, so with that, I'm going to stop and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, and we are opposed. <laughs> I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. If you have, Daniel, oh, Jaime, and then Pablo. Daniel, uh, can you show us again the equation for the matrix Q? There it is. So uh, the variable R is the sum and the variable X is the sum also, no? Yes. So if why you can ask why, I don't know. Okay, so that, that was my first question. And the second? <laughs> that's, the that's, let, let me just answer a little bit. That's also surprising. We don't really understand why these are the variables that show up. Oh. Yeah, in X, uh, I guess it's a sort of a smoothing, but I, uh, I'm not sure. But uh, the matrix Q, uh, you you know some properties of that matrix? So it's negative yeah. definite or something like that? Um, good. I don't think we, we don't know, and I don't think we could prove, not for now, that it is uh, positive definite or negative definite or anything like that. So Q is sort of explicit. Q sort of. So it's not a physical matrix. It's, it's not representing, as far as we know, anything physical about the process itself. Um, what it is, so the diagonal 
give. Uh, we know what the diagonal is. The diagonal essentially comes from uh, the one point distributions. Um, but if you look at the matrix, uh, the complete matrix, it, it's, it's an algebraic uh, thing. So it, it comes, it's constructed out of the kernel K. So you have to do something with the kernel. Essentially, it's like one minus identity minus K inverse times some derivative of K, and that's Q. And we don't know of a good physical interpretation of that, but you can evolve it. And as you evolve it and then take the trace, you get back. Um, but no, we don't really know much about its property. Thank you. There is a question by Pablo Groisman, I think. OK, well, uh, first of all, thanks for the talk. I always uh, enjoy uh, your talks for like Thanks. more general audience that I, I love all the, these talks from you. Uh, and my question is the following. Uh, there has been in the last years a, a lot of uh, uh, progress uh, on the integrable side, uh, much of them uh, due to you, <laughs> which I found them impressive. Of course, they are impressive and amazing. Uh, and my question is, I, I, I didn't hear in the last few years uh, any progress on the non-integrable side. Is, is there any progress uh, on the non-integrable side or yes. we are stuck about that? No, there's a lot of, okay. It's, that's a, in a way, it's a hard question because you would have to define what is non-integrable. So in the general side, if you take a general process and you try to show something like universality, which would be, would be Take something like TASEP, but with very general um, transition rates and try to show that it goes to, to the KBZ fixed point, that's open. That example that I just mentioned is not so open anymore. Uh, but yes, there has been, so, so there's a different approach. I was going to mention it at the end, but, but I ran out of time. So there's a different approach to constructing the KPZ fixed point, uh, which again uses integrability, but in a different way. Uh, so that gives you something called the uh, heavy sheet or the directed landscape, and it gives you a sort of variational description of the same object. And there's recent work from last year, one is by Sarkar and Pastel, the other one is by Virat, where they show uh, that the KPZ equation converges to the KPZ fixed point. And uh, some other models converge to the KPZ fixed point, in particular ASET. So the non-totally asymmetric version of uh, the exclusion process. Uh, and they all use, okay, so, so it's two sets of, of, uh, of, uh, of works and they use still special properties of this model. So th they can be completely generalized. So it's, it's specific generalizations, but very strong, in particular the one, the one for the KPZ equation, uh, to models which have some integrability, okay? Uh, again, in, the, in the case of the exclusion process, it is a little bit beyond uh, the cases where you have integrability. It uses some uh, essentially techniques from hydrodynamic limits uh, to get uh, results. But but it, it's still it's 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 a great result. It's still specific to some models for which you can get uh, specific estimates. Uh, but the general answer to your question is so the the, the general question uh, or in any generality it remains completely open. But there has been uh, amazing. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah no, but, but, but what you say looks like like great progress, right? Like so. So yes. they they don't rely on integrability. They 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 have other no, techniques. They, no, they do. They do rely on integrability. Ah, okay. But more softly, if you want. Okay. <laughs> in different in, in in different ways. So no, we we. we so, so yeah, you still use the KPZ fixed point formulas, but now you use them to compare with something else. And as long as you can, so that's one set of things. Uh, the other one, which uses a directed landscape, uh, it uses integrability in a very different way than that I have shown through something called essentially the RSK, the robinson shinstead knur correspondence and a, and, and a nice version of that. Uh, so yeah, we are not away, very far away yet from integrability, but the thing has been expanded. Yeah. So after this work, yeah, it has been expanded in, in, in various directions. And, and the hope is to continue in this like that, but who knows? It's, it's hard. Okay, so let's, uh, maybe there's another question. We're really out of time, but if you have one question, we can finish with that. Okay, if not, let's thanks Daniel again. And, and yeah, of course. And, so we can stop recording and, and...